I think when I gave lectures 20 or 30 years ago, I didn't have the habit of wanting to start every new whatever I'm doing with so. That's become so common, right? I, you know, I, I have this urge of saying, so, welcome back, or so, this is what we were doing last time. And I don't think that I've always been doing this. There, there was something else there. But I tried to make a conscious habit of breaking that and not starting this with so. So if you find me jumping into your coffee break rather abruptly, that's because I try to remain conscious of what I'm saying. Which doesn't always mean I'm making sense, but at least I try. So we left off with this plot of PC <laughs> of PCA scale beta. And uh, clusters begin to become apparent. Now, <clears throat> I don't know if you've looked at biplots uh, yesterday, but another common way to plot PCA results is by so-called biplots. So a biplot is a plot of principal components. Uh, it automatically um, plots the, the row index of the individual points that, data points that, that contributed here. And um, it also plots the projections of the original axis onto that original component. So in this case here, we're plotting principal component one against principal component two. And the uh, projections <coughs> actually already show us that most of the original value, uh, dimensions here are kind of orthogonal on, on PC1 to the greatest degree, so this is what actually then becomes apparent as the large correlations between the values that, that you see. So by default, uh, this plots against PC1, PC2. With the parameter choices, we can tell it to plot different things, i.e. PC2 against PC3. And now we could um, squint very carefully and start uh, pulling out these numbers and typing the numbers into a selection vector which we could then use to, to um, classify our data. Now here in the projection of PC2 and PC3, you see that the different dimensions are actually nicely distributed. So that's the hallmark of that the principal component captures information from all of the original dimensions in the same way. Now, something I haven't looked at before is uh, comparing this to the unscaled values. Um, I calculate a PCAO for original from the original CRABS data and plot that. It looks like that. If I do the biplots, we get them here. I have the impression that the clustering in this unscaled analysis is actually... Um, better or more pronounced than in the scaled analysis. But without knowing which ones of these are the, the, uh, the oranges and the triangles, it's, it's kind of hard to tell. So now we finally get to that challenge of plotting these things with color and shape coding the different categories. <clears throat> if you've uh, reached, uh, if you've uh, researched this um, on Google, you you probably quickly noticed that what you need for triangles and circles uh, is different plotting characters. Uh, if I remember correctly, these are uh, PCH 17 and 19 for filled shapes. You could also have used one of the 21 and and 22 for coloring borders and backgrounds differently. And these will give us, uh, well, triangles and circles. <clears throat> if you need, need different shapes and different convoluted shapes, um, 
you can you can plot many other characters um, or just make up your own shapes and plot them individually as polygons, even though that for large plots this, this may be slow. Okay, so we need PCH 17 and 19 and we need colors blue and orange and the super pedestrian solution for that is um, to exploit the fact that they're already ordered in in our um, original data set, so rows 1 to 50 are uh, one category and 51 to 100 are another category and we can just go ahead and plot that. Um, it's lame, but we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll show you how to do it. Um, so we are, we're plotting rows 1 to 50 of the rotated data of column 2 against rows 1 to 50 of the rotated data of column 3. And using uh, plotting character 17 and coloring this blue as points. And these go here. And then 51 to 100 um, go here. And 50, 101 to 150 go here and, and that. So that's how these distribute. Uh, in, indeed, they, they, they can be pretty well separated along these dimensions. Um, now comparing that to the unscaled data, <coughs> yeah, it's kind of different. Now you notice that orange is down and here orange is up, so that's completely unpredictable. That just depends on how, what the variances uh, uh, happen to be, and it underscores the fact that we can't really interpret these principal components um, in relating them down back to any uh, back to the semantics of our original data. Um, whether Okay, well, that, that's just a scaling problem. Okay, right. Here we go. That's more like it. Not so squished. Um, <coughs> I, I would say they're approximately equally well separated in principle, um, but indeed, I, th I think the clusters that appear here, especially for the orange ones, appear a little, a little more pronounced. Now, of course, as I said, doing it this way is lame. What we'd actually want is a function that, that takes um, the factors which we have as parameters and then um, translates these, these factors um, into something else, so translates factor one into blue or factor two into female. And the way we do that in principle, and uh, thanks for, for Maya for bringing that to my attention, that this is really key and important. It's so important that, I, that I've stopped to think about, you know, that this is actually part of what you need to know. Um, <clears throat> that's the downside of experience. You, you, you don't remember what you didn't know. Um, So how do we translate values into different types of values? This is what comes up again and again and again as we write scripts. So for example, if I have um, values red and white, and I can build a named vector from that. So now I have a named vector. The vector has, is a character vector. It has two components, two elements. First element is red. The second element is white. The first element is named capital R. The second element is named capital W. So now I can use an index vector to map values to something. So assume my data set um, has factors of uh, R and W, which numerically translate to ones and twos in, in some way. And it's a large data set of 2,000 columns. So, but what I want for my plot is the actual color names, red and white. <clears throat> so I simply take that vector, whatever uh, data, dollar, type, what, whatever the column is, I take that vector, 
In this case, I define it as uh, in one, which is simply a vector of numbers, one, two, one, one, two, one. And I put that into a subsetting expression for my values. Now, technically, you'd think of a subset as something smaller, but subsetting can be done with more elements than the vector actually contains, and then some of them obviously will be repeated. So if I put one in one into square brackets attached to my values, I get red, white, red, red, white, red. Right? <clears throat> the first index of my values, the sec this the first element of my values, the second element of my values, two times the first element, again the second element, again the first element, and so on. So applied to our, our crabs data, I would be taking a vector like blue and orange, and I would take, be taking column one of the data set, the SP, the species column, so crabs dollar SP, and put that into a vector like that, and then I would get labels of blue and orange, which would then color the plots in, uh, the points in my plot accordingly. Maya. I didn't understand this, and now you've lost me again. <laughs> so when we did this, you were coding like the red and white and the red and white, but what happened when you're doing the index? Like, so does it inherently understand that like R slash red, I guess R is No, it big? doesn't. That's, that's an example that that could possibly apply to factors because um, honestly, I, I don't know what when you when you query a named vector with a factor whether it queries by the contents, i.e. the numbers, or whether it queries by the levels. Yeah, I so would need to try that out. Um, that's a little bit. Involved. But let's not let's 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 not talk a lot more about factors. Um, this is just one example. The vector doesn't need to be named. It can be named. If we name it, then we can use letters, and I'll do that in the second example, but we can just use numbers, you know, map something into numbers and then start pulling out and translating the numbers into elements of a vector. It's completely general. I can use logical expressions. I can use, you know, wh whatever. But <clears throat> translating the named vectors by using names, and this is where we had our example of B and O and blue and orange. Um, if my input vector is the letters W, W, R, R, W, R, and I put that into the subsetting expression for my values, this in two, then I get the same result. Or actually the, the, the opposite result here. W for white and red and white and red. Now, if my, my values vector would have been blue and orange, and I would have named them with B and O, my values is <coughs> blue and orange. And the names are B and O. I get blue and orange labels right from my um, right from the contents of the first column of my crabs data and and now I'm actually curious so um, So species is a factor with two levels, blue and orange, B and O, where B has, where the, where the number one has the level B, and the number two has the level O. So that happens to coincide with what I've defined here. How do I find out now whether factors select by, 
level or by, by index? Well, I just turn it around, right? Now in this case, my oranges are index one and my blues are index two. <coughs> so now if, I quer if a factor queries by level, I get the correct result because the names still match. If the factor queries by its contents, I will get the wrong result. Any, any bets on what will happen? I have no idea. Greg, what do you think? Lauren. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so what happened? give us the correct result with the inverted result? Well, because internally an, a factor is a vector of integers, and the integers are then named with, with maps. But what the subsetting expression sees is the integers, and it works with the integers. It doesn't care about the levels. So the subsetting expression is not smart enough to recognize that this is a factor and then work with the levels as row names. You'd need to do that by hand. Can we do it by hand? Of course. We just need to, to change our factors into, into the row names as character. This is how we change our factors into a vector of their levels. Um, what? <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> so there's some weirdness here. What did I just do? My values crap all this B. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it went, it went wrong at first, and now when we use as character, it, it gets to be correct. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, if we're using a subsetting expression, you can subset either by index or by um, the row name or the element name. And if we name it my value, that's what we do. We, we, we subset or we choose by element name. Now you say, why can't we just choose by the value name? Well, that would be um, something like this. Um, directly choosing it from the name, we'd have some kind of a result vector. of character elements and as many as we have rows. And then I could say um,
So here I would go and say, which ones of my, my values are equal to the string B? And then I get a logical vector, which I can use for subsetting, and, uh, and then I assign the word blue to all of the matches here. And conversely for orange. So this is going by the contents of my translation vector. But that's less efficient because we have to do this comparison every time. It's, it's, it's more efficient to either use indices or in the most general way, we just use what we want to choose from as row names or as element names and use that to map. Now that, that comes up all the time in many situations, mapping values to color or to shape or to size in a plot or somewhere where, where I use it all the time too is to map accession IDs to gene names. So I have a little mapping vector that, that maps um, uh, Hugo gene symbols to uh, ensemble gene names for example, and then I just pull out my Hugo gene symbols in a very large table and, and uh, everything gets translated. Okay, now how do we <coughs> actually do this in practice? I've, I've, I've written a function, um, crabs plot which was loaded uh, from R, or which should be loaded uh, from your R folder if you type init. If it's not loaded, just do type init, then it's, then it's loaded. Uh, it's a function that takes parameters x and y and species, sex and age, and, and plots all of that. Now, <coughs> there are three things that I want to vary here. One thing is I want to vary the plotting character. And that works in exactly the same way that we've just discussed. No, the, another thing is I want to define the colors. In this case, I want to be a little more sophisticated, not just of blue and orange. I want to have different oranges based on whether they're male or female, and different blues based on whether they're male and female. So I want to consider both of the columns, the male and the, the species and the, and the sex at the same time. And the third thing is, I want to take the size into account. I want, to t I want to scale the large ones with large characters and small ones with small characters. And I'll just walk you through what I'm doing here. So <coughs> creating a vector of plotting characters. In, in this case, um, I'm plotting um, filled characters, so the plotting character 21 and 24 with a background color. My PCH set is 24 and 21. 24 is for the females, the circle, and 21 is for the males, the triangle. And my crab plotting character is as integer whatever I feed the function as a vector named sex. Exactly. So if it's a factor that I'm putting in here, I'm taking the ones and the twos, okay. and I'm, so I'm doing this by index here. So you need to make sure that your female oh, 24 right. is in the right place. Right. Okay. I, I could also have said as character six, and then I would have had to name my PCH set. Yeah. Okay. Probably the safer way to do it that way. I don't need, because I, I can't actually make guarantees about the order of the levels in, in an unordered factor. Okay, so that's the simple thing. A little more involved is if I have a color set of four, uh, two different blues and two different oranges that I, I want to select from based on two different columns. So otherwise it, work, it would work in exactly the same way, but I said, yeah, I, I want to be a little more you know, sophisticated here. So let's combine these two. And the idea is, is really very simple. Um, assume that <coughs> 
um, assume that we, we can treat these as, as binaries. So then I can just combine them as binary numbers. If they're both zero, I get a zero. If one is, um, actually that would be a three, this would be a one, uh, sorry, that. Uh, this would be a three, this would be two, and, 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 and the binary one. And then I just add one to that, so this would be one of the three. So I, I can compute myself an index. I, need, I maybe need a little time to figure out exactly how that will work, but from properties in one or more columns, compute myself an index into, into a vector and then put the right colors into the right place. So computing this is my, my color index is taking as integer species minus one, which takes the ones and twos and transforms them into um, zeros and ones multiplied by 2, and then add as integer 6, which is 1 and 2. So if this is 0, I get uh, 1 or 2. And if this is 1, I get 3 or 4. So then I have 1, 2, 3, 4 as possible combinations of the two. And then I can plunk that into call index, and I just need to make sure that the right colors appear in the right space. And that defines my colors. And then creating a scale vector um, basically is also very straightforward arithmetic, taking a range of one and transforming it into a range of another. So the range of one thing um, could be the means of all the columns. So taking, taking the, the, the measurement means, uh, the, the row means of my measurements, um, would give me an average of how, how these crabs grow, and, and that would basically give me a stand-in based on the data uh, of their age or their total body weight. Um, <clears throat> and then I, I need to define a range into which I want to map this to, and a useful scale for character expansions is something like going from 0 0.5 to 4. So 1 is the standard size of a character that you see in a plot. 0 0.5 is half of that. 4 is four times of that. Um, this is my scale min and my uh, scale 0. So I do this in two steps. They're a little redundant. I could, I could mangle this together at, at the loss of uh, being uh, explicit. First, I transform whatever I get in here in my age or whatever numbers appear in that column. Um, I transform that into the range of going from 0 to 1. And I do that by subtracting the minimum value and dividing by the difference between the maximum and the minimum. Right? So that's how you scale an arbitrary range into the interval 0 to 1. Subtract the smallest value and then divide by the difference between the, uh, the max and the minimum. So age minus minimum of age divided by max age minus min age transforms that into that scale. So now I have zeros to ones, and I want to get that into the range 0 0.5 to 4. So I add, um, or, or I transform S max times uh, minus S min plus S min and multiply that by the, the factors. So I, I take whatever values I have and I scale them into a different range and I can use that range now to define Cx. And then I just need to plot um, with main and x-axis labels, y-axis labels. My plotting character is crab PCH. This is what we defined here. My color is black, so they all get black borders. My background colors of these filled plotting characters is my crab calls, which I defined here by munging together the two different columns into, into four different values. And my character expansion factor is the crab CX, which I scaled here. Now, what does this work of coding art actually do? Crabs plot 
So, oh my god, how do I need to call it? Um, X is PCAS dollar um, X column two. Y is PCA S dollar X all the rows column three. What else do I need? The next one is species, which is crabs dollar species. The next one is sex crabs dollar sex the next one is age um, and we said as a stand-in for age we'll just take the row means of all the data columns Um, similarly, there's also call means, but let me check whether that actually works. Yep, that gives me values. And main is um, scaled crab. Categories. Then we have xlab and ylab. So <clears throat> if you notice the function signature, um, x, y, species, sex, and age have no default. So if I don't supply any of these values, um, the function is not going to run. But main x-axis label, y-axis label have a default of an empty string. So if I don't put anything there, it will plot with an empty, with an empty character. If I do put something there, the empty string is overwritten, and then I get an actual value here. So xlab is pc2 and ylab is pc and plotted and there you go oh my god PLOS biology here I come <laughs> <laughs> now what does that tell us I could have used slightly nicer colors but what does that tell us? What do we see here? So something we haven't looked at before is the size of um, the characters, the CX. Is that all over the place, or is there a trend? Data interpretation. You can immediately infer an interesting part of biology from this plot. The larger ones are more discordant. Right. The larger they get, or the more they age, the more morphometrically distinct they become. So they express their differences with size, especially noticeable on the axis that <coughs> seems to be separating triangles and circles. So the sex differences are strongly dependent on age. As they're very small, they kind of all cluster together. So oranges and, and, and reds are less dependent on, on size, but uh, um, the differences between the triangles and the circles is more, is greater and greater the larger they get. 
Well, that's, that has an obvious biological interpretation. That's for the originals. So the, the, the fact that um, the sex differences scale with size is kind of less obvious in this one. So even though I think the clustering is, is more distinct, the, the scale plot is more informative. terms of the biological interpretation, um, we still have a tendency, especially for the blue ones, that overlap is greater for um, very small species. This is the unscaled. This is the unscaled. These, oh. these are the original ones. Oh. Right. Um, <coughs> saved, committed, uploaded, available for your perusal. Now, in my um, dimension reduction script, I would now do dimension and um, PCA analysis on the LPS data set. But in fact, this is more of the same. Um, it's maybe even not as enjoyable because the, the end result is, is, is more or less that um, PCA doesn't give us very good separation of, of the LPS data set. A little bit. We can find some interesting things there. But I'd, li I'd rather like to move on and show you a different kind of principal component analysis. And you can just do the script at home. I think um, it's, it's more self-explanatory. I would like to talk about a different way of, two different ways of um, dimension reduction, one of, one of which um, I haven't written into here because we've actually done that yesterday. Uh, when we were doing regressions by looking at correlations against models. So if I do a correlation with the model, then what I'm essentially doing is I'm taking a high dimensional data set and projecting it along a dimension that is defined by that model. <coughs> so like the PCA has a contribution from every single different dimension, um, if I'm, if I'm uh, projecting or doing a correlation of an expression data set on a sine wave, every single time point contributes to that sine wave with different strengths. And that also gives me a projection. If I take two different models, for example, a sine wave and a decay function, or something like that, or a high frequency and a low frequency sine wave, or two phase shifted sine waves, and I do a correlation, uh, um, and I plot as a scatter plot the correlations I derive from one model and the other model, then I'm doing exactly the same thing as with a PCA with two dimensions. I'm projecting into a low dimensional space. And that can be very useful if we have strong and reasonable and, 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 and valid assumptions about what underlying models could be that have generated our data. So that, that could in fact be a very useful approach. And then the number of dimensions that you retain really just depends on the number of models that you're plotting against. 
And of course, you can do mixed approaches. I can plot one dimension against the sine wave and another dimension against the second dimension of my PCA. There's, there's no limit to this. As an exploratory method, whatever way I can spread out and project and analyze my data uh, might be useful to discover structure in my data. Now, there's an approach called TSNE, T stochastic neighbor embedding. You, we, you didn't do that yesterday, right? No. no. Okay. So, T stochastic neighbor embedding is, is one of the things that our um, rock star faculty member, Joff Hinton, developed in 2007. Um, <clears throat> and it's an embedding method of high dimensional data. So, what T stochastic neighbor embedding does, it, it calculates a, a statistic of distance in high dimensional space, and then it finds stochastically projections into a low dimensional space that will, in the best possible way, um, preserve the distances between points. So this is a stochastic and, and, and completely random method, and again, the resulting dimensions um, don't have any interpretation whatsoever, except <coughs> that if you project them along these dimensions, the distances um, between the points stay reasonably in intact. Distances between points staying intact means that similar points end up close together on the two-dimensional plot. PCA also preserves distances now. Hmm? The PCA also preserves distances now. I'm not sure I, I can answer that. Um, I, can, I can say that, yes, that's exactly what it looks like. But on the other hand, I don't think there's a mathematical guarantee for that. That, that yeah, no, I, I don't think that, that there's a very predictable relationship about the, say, Euclidean distance in the high dimensional space and the actual distance between points on a two dimensional projection. But let's look at TSNE, what it does. It's a, it's a package. Um, I have my, my normal idiom here, if not require TSNE, install packages library TSNE. If you run that, by the way, after it successfully installs, you will see a warning that says the package is not available. That might lead you to think that something went wrong. But that's not actually the case. I, I, I just can't turn this off without major surgery in, and, and, and resetting global options, which I don't want to do. So what happens here is the quietly equals true actually only applies to when the script is sourced. So when you source the script, it's actually quiet. It doesn't throw a warning. But if you interactively execute this, the warning is raised that the package doesn't exist once you run require. So require returns a value of false because it couldn't find the package, but it also raises the warning, and that then kind of floats around. Because it first starts installing the package, then it loads the library, then everything is done, then it comes out of the if loop, then it takes a breather and says, do I have anything else to do? Oh, there's a warning there. Yeah, I have to show that warning. And you see the warning, but the warning is no longer relevant. But of course, at that point, it can be confusing. So if you run this and it installs, and then it says, warning, no such thing is available, um, don't worry. This is just a, a side effect of the require. If it says error or something, that shouldn't happen. But you can actually <coughs> check, and you should, um, about the contents of a newly installed package with these three little idioms that, that are really useful. Library help equals TSNE will give me a help page um, that tells me uh, the, the description of the, pack of the package um, and what the uh, functions are that it contains. So here, TSNE package contains actually only one function, and that's TSNE itself. Um, packages 
usually have so-called vignettes. This one doesn't. Vignettes are basically PDF versions. Well done vignettes. We'll have nicely worked out examples and explanations what the hell the package does. Not so well done um, vignettes are simply a PDF printout of the help pages, which are often less than helpful for newcomers. They're very technical and assume that you already know what you're doing. Um, some packages don't have vignettes like this one because they're assumed to be kind of self-explanatory. And some packages have attached data sets. Um, so TS, uh, TSNE doesn't, but for example, MAS does. That's where we loaded the, the crabs data from. MAS actually has a lot of data sets that you can experiment with and, and play with. Um, so, explore your packages, use library, use browse vignettes, and use data. Now, TSNE <coughs> runs stochastically over many iterations. It pauses every few iterations to plot what it's been doing. So, um, it has so-called epochs of, um, I believe, by default, 100 iterations. And then uh, it triggers an epochs callback, which is a function. So the epoch callback parameter needs a function, which we need to define. The function that we need to define is a useful function um, that will plot our our data in, in an informative way. So the plotting function here could be TSNE plot, which is a function of x, which is the crabs plot with x dimension 1, x dimension 2. Now, now these are not um, the x's from the principal component analysis. These are the x values that uh, TSNE, the t-stochastic neighbor embedding, produces. Um, then column 1 of crabs, 2 of crabs, um, the first dimension of PCA crabs, actually that wouldn't work here because we've now called it uh, PCAS. If you want to run this, you, you actually need to make that change. So does that mean that to do this type of analysis you need to have run a PCA already? Or no. Okay. No. Well, I, could use, I could use anything. I just need these parameters for my plotting function. So the crab plot function needs these parameters. Remember, when, when we showed that, we took the mean um, right. of, of, the, of the data columns as a stand-in for age. Here I'm just taking the first dimension of the PCA, okay. which should be kind of the same thing. And um, I give it a title, crabs, TS, and E, and so on. So this defines a plotting function. So I set the seed. Now, TSNE crabs. Embed the columns 4 to 8. Uh, whenever you've done 100 stochastic steps, plot the result. And perplexity and max iterations are, um, well, max iterations tells, tells it when to stop. Perplexity. Perplexity? What about it? What is it actually? Oh, um, Can you define it? So, uh, oh. I can't, like, it's, it's, the, it's going to uh, lead you to have certain levels of clusters, kind of. Like, if you have your complexity is uh, smaller, you're going to have more tightly grouped uh, data. Like, yeah. so you can put your complexity as two, and so you're going to find your data is kind of paired off. And if your complexity is, say, 30, it's going to be in slightly larger chunks. Um, I experiment with different levels. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's always a suggestion here. You just try it out with default parameters, and then you play around with parameters and see what you get. Um, the parameters you play with is you adjust perplexity, um, you adjust seeds. This is, this is important. Different seeds do have different values. So anyway, uh, let's run this thing. And that's the embedding here. 
So this takes time, especially for large data sets. It, it can eat uh, quite a lot of CPU cycles. Um, <clears throat> this is not uh, mathematically principled in any particular way, except that um, it turns out that it usually does a good job of showing you structure in high dimensional data sets. Now just as in PCA, even though it's a completely different uh, uh, algorithm, it turns out that uh, projecting along a good separating dimension in, in two dimensions um, also um, says the, the greatest differences in points are if uh, the overall age is larger. So let's let's try this again with a with a different seed. So the first iteration doesn't do anything meaningful, and then kind of starts finding things. Actually, this one is is quite a bit better. So that's T, S, and E, T stochastic neighbor embedding. Is there a general reason why you would use that over uh, <coughs> PCA? Or are they kind of a preference thing? Or if you're looking to explore more? Or I don't think that there's a principled reason. What I see uh, recently is that many of the uh, single cell RNA-seq papers are using T, S, and E simply because it gives a global nice separation on clustering of the data. So the way to work with that in TS and E, and I, I, I think we'll mention that in, in, in the clustering unit, is you plot something, you get a clustered structure, then you apply some kind of labeling. I say this is, these are monocytes and these are macrophages, and then you label your plots or you put colors on your plots, and then you see whether um, the labels kind of cluster together in one region of the plot. If that happens, that means the high dimensional data has structure that supports the labels which we may get from a completely different experiment. Okay. Usually the, the very non-trivial um, um, interpretation of uh, single cell RNA-seq experiments, where they actually do this, they see nice clusters in the, in the in the uh, TSNE embedding, and then they see that, yeah, these cell types are here, and these cells, cell types are there, and that means tissues are real. It really means that tissues have significantly and recognizably different gene expression profiles, which is not trivial. You know, they're, they're. Tissue identity could be defined by something else but gene expression profiles, but it's not, no. Actually, the way we think about it, gene expression profile defines tissue identity. That's actually what our single cell seek experiments show, by and large. Yeah? So when I get a cluster from the TSA, mm -hmm. um, can I go back and see which, for example, genes or whatever measurements I did affected this cluster? Um, what you need to do is you need to identify these points. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in the cluster. Mind you, I'm not getting clusters. I am getting a two-dimensional plot of my data. TSD knows nothing about clusters. This is not a cluster. We see clusters because there's structure in the data. A clustering means actually doing this mathematically and then saying that point has a label of two and that point has a label of three and that point has a label of four. TSD doesn't tell me about these labels. That's something I put into the data because my data were labeled to begin with. Yes, my question is, what practically do I do with this? So, I mean, I get this. You I see that there is structure. <coughs> practically, it's, it's a very quick way to see whether your data has, whether your high dimensional data has internal structure that is possibly useful to exactly do something like clustering. So if I see this, I immediately see, oh yeah, clustering is going to work. We're going okay. to find ways to, um, to, to break this apart. If I only see a single point cloud, then you know, I probably it would be nice to add additional data. <coughs> so it's just a preliminary stage 
preliminary or to um, map experimental data. Like for example, if this were just point cloud and now I would have information like the red and green, then uh, the blue, then I would be able to map red and blue to that and then show in this plot that the labels which I have derived from some external information actually correspond to the mathematical differences in my high dimensional measured boundaries, like gene expression. Yeah. Uh, yeah, another reason you may want to think about uh, TSME versus PCA. PCA is a linear embedding, yeah. and TSME is nonlinear. So if you're trying to recover structure that isn't necessarily linear in your data, uh, TSME will show you that, whereas PCA won't show you that. So, so it's, it allows you to see more complex structure than PCA. <coughs> Always no, you can do it high dimensional. We, I, I'm actually going to show you an example of three dimensional TSNE, and you can be very much higher dimensional. So, <coughs> in fact, it may be useful as a dimension reduction method as well. Um, instead of PCA, if you say if you have a hundred dimensional something and you want to break it down to only five dimensions because you want to do some machine learning with it, you can try TSNE rather than PCA and see which one captures the variation in your data better. If the variation is, is not well separable or linearly independent, um, TSNE may give you something useful, whereas uh, PCA is just going to say each of the PCs is equally important. Which really brings us to the C word. We've, we've spoken about clusters so much. Let's do something with clustering. So our clustering unit is introduction to clustering. And <clears throat> as the data I'm going to play with, um, I'm going to use, again, expression data. We always seem to be using expression data. It's just large sets of numbers. Many other experiments don't give large sets of numbers. And in this case, I, again, I'm sorry, I'm using cell cycle data. Um, but this is a human cell cycle experiment. Uh, one cell cycle of HeLa cells. And um, the first part of actually loading the expression data is derived from GEO2R. So I don't know if you've ever used GEO2R before. Uh, GEO2R is one of the very nice results on the NCBI webpage. Um, <clears throat> so this is the GEO data set GSE 26922, cell cycle expression profiles in HeLa cells published in 2012. And there's an option to analyze such data with GEO2R. So this is microarray data. Unfortunately, I don't think they've yet built a tool to uh, analyze RNA-seq data with GEO2R. So that's something you would need to do at home. So if you ever need to, to analyze microarray data with GEO2R, you, you can at least get started with the code on the, from the NCBI side. Um, if you need to do this with RNA-seq data, the Bioconductor project has um, a lot of tutorials and help information of how to analyze RNA-seq data. So there are very well described workflows there and, and standard operations. So when we analyze something with, with GEO2R, um, first thing we want to do is to define groups. So to define groups, um, we could call one group T0. Um, one group T2, T4, T6, T8, and T12. 2, T4, T6, T8, T12. And um, I can select 
three columns here, click on T0, select three rows here, oops, T2, T4, T6, T8, and T12. Because these are all um, biological replicates of the same information. So they should all have the same values, well, you know, more or less. But a way to analyze data like this is to average the biological replicates and, and then look at that information. So the first thing is to define my groups. And the second thing is then to look at the value distribution of my groups. which is this here. <coughs> so they're very nicely distributed. Um, they go from 4 to 16. So what are these values? Bless you. They're not raw counts, right? I think these are already log transformed in some way, maybe log ratios to some standard or, or reference. Now, that's fine. I don't need to, to um, scale them in, in any particular way. What you're looking for in an experiment that can be well interpreted is that they all have the same mean and approximate standard deviation. On average, in, in uh, RNA expression experiments, nothing should happen. It's just a, s a small number of, of genes for which something actually happens. And incidentally, um, what we are doing here is we're treating them all as independent. This is not actually a time series analysis. There's additional statistical information from the fact that, that uh, they are actually ordered in a time series, which we're not exploiting here. <coughs> but um, what I can then do is uh, to calculate a table of the top 250 differentially expressed genes. So given these groups here, um, GO2R gets me the expression, uh, the, the, the top differentially expressed genes according to the p-value of the differences or an adjusted p-value which takes um, multiple testing into account, which we may talk a little bit more about this afternoon. Um, it gives you the scores for that, the ID, which is the ID on the spot. Um, it gives you an actual uh, gene, an actual expression profile or a value profile here. And indeed, you see this is one that, that is down and then it goes up and then it comes down again. So it does look somewhat differentially expressed. Importantly, what you will always find on the high scoring values is that all of the individual values are quite similar. Within each group? within each group. And that's because significance in this game doesn't just mean the change is large. It means that there's a small standard deviation of the individual measurements and change. So the small standard deviation is really important. If I, by some measurement chance, have three absolutely identical measurements <coughs> of one thing and then three absolutely identical measurements which are slightly larger that algorithm would tell me that's a very significant difference because the standard deviation is so small. I should be trusting my measurements so much that even small differences become highly significant. So that's a bit of a downside. The top expressed genes are not the strongest differences. They're, they're the ones that are most statistically significant given that um, measurements have a certain standard deviation here. 
And we get the gene symbol and gene title, so this is a histone cluster. If we look at the second one here, also this, this thing, um, but it correlates in a different way. If we scroll to the bottom, so this is one of the less significant ones. <coughs> Right? So what you see here is that still we have, a, we have a great trend along our clusters, but slightly higher variation in the individual measurements, and this makes the result less trustworthy to the algorithm. So this is standard type of differential expression analysis, and, and now the very cool thing about it is that it automatically generates an R script, which you can copy and paste and use at home and modify to your heart's content for your own purposes. Um, it's a little bit salty in the way that it works. Um, but what I've done is essentially, um, I've, I've taken this R script uh, for GSE uh, 26922, and I've pasted it in here, and we'll, we'll just go through it very briefly. So what we need for that is um, bioconductor libraries. <coughs> bioconductor libraries or, or packages are loaded in a different way from CRAN packages. So whereas from CRAN you load things right away as they are, for bioconductor you source a file which is called bioclight.r um, from the bioconductor project site. Sourcing this file installs the function BioC light. That function handles the installation of packages. So then we call the function BioC light biobase, BioC light geoquery, BioC light lima. These are packages that are needed to build, to download the data and build these, these differential tables. Now, when you do that and you have existing bioconductor installations already on your system, more often than not, it will happen that it says, I'm finding old packages here. Do you want me to update them? And you have a number of choices, yes and no, um, and all if yes means just one, no means nothing, all means all of them. At that point, I always type A for all. Because bioconductor packages rely a lot on each other in, 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 in different ways. So if some of them are outdated, they might not play well with the newer versions of packages. So it's a good idea to keep all the bioconductor packages at the same level, approximately. So you always, when it asks you yes or no or all, you always say all to bioconductor packages. Then it may ask you, well, some of them need to be compiled from source, though, because we haven't got a pre-compiled version um, at the bioconductor repository. To that, always reply no, unless you know what you're doing. You so might need a bleeding edge development version that is actually compiled from source, but in general, uh, the versions that are available at bioconductor um, that are already pre-compiled the newest versions of that is what would normally be called something like a stable release. So if you're asked about packaging updates, yes. If you're asked about compiling from source, no. That's only if you really need the very, very newest, and you know that you need the very, very newest, and you know why you need it, and um, you know that your system actually has the correct compilers and tools to build it on your machine. So once you do that, you have these packages installed, and then, just like with packages from CRAN, we need to say library, uh, biobase, geoquery, and lima. So let's see what I do here. Um, biobase. Yeah, it asks me update all sum none. So. In this case, I actually say none. I want to be slow about it because I've done this yesterday, so nothing much will have changed since then. I've gone through all of this yesterday. Jump, jump, jump. OK. <coughs> 
So if that works for you, you may be able to download the gene set GSE2699 from GEO, and you may not be. That's really unpredictable. I don't know why this is so patchy, especially in workshops I get the impression that maybe the, the NCBI um, site uh, notices that many people from the same domain are trying to get the same large data set at the same time and it thinks there's something fishy going on like a DDoS attack and then it starts shutting it down. So it may work, it may not work. That's the standard way of doing it. GSET um, is simply the, the variable name that I use here is the result of the function get geo with the geo data set name. Now if it doesn't work for you, uh, the data set is actually in your data folder. Um, I've compressed it here. It's, it's large-ish as, as is to be expected, gse2699.r data. So you can either download it from NCBI, but if that doesn't go without a problem, just select and execute load data gse26922.r data. If you do download it, you still have to uh, pull the first element out of a container list. So execute lines 114 to 119 as well. Um, no, of course you can import RNA-seq data. Um, but actually the way that, that you import um, RNA-seq data from, from GEO is usually, um, it's structured in a different way. It's not these annotated gene sets, but it's usually just a tab delimited file uh, of, of, the, of the expression values per gene. So uh, you download that from, uh, as FTP, it's, it's just, you usually just read it in with uh, a, a read delim or a read.csv. <clears throat> so if I do a, a, a head of that, it tells me this is an expression set, assay data. Um, it tells me that there are 18 different samples corresponding to three samples each for the six time points. Um, feature data, annotation, which is the annotation, and so on and so on. If I look into the internals of this thing and, and do STR, you will see something that's a fair bit more complex than um, what we've seen before with lists and other data structures. So these are um, S4 objects. R actually has two different um, types of objects for real object-oriented programming. One is the S S3 class, one is the S4 class. These are all S4. And the syntax to get stuff out from these is different, um, but it's, it's possible. Um, you, you can pull things out um, from bioconductor objects, um, but normally you don't. Normally you leave these objects alone and you depend on other bioconductor functions to know about how they are structured and what to reasonably do with them. So, so these, are, these are a bit more complex than what we've worked with so far. Okay, um, right, so then I, I simply go um, over the code, it needs column names, it needs group names, it needs to, to be told which samples correspond to which, to which groups, so group zero to group five here. Then it did a log two transform. Now I'm not sure that that's actually a good thing to do, to log transform our data again. I think we've already log transformed it, so I'm, you know, would we get different data if we didn't do that? I, I haven't experimented with that, but the script which we ran on, on the Geo2R website did this log transform. 
Um, <clears throat> it does a bit of a quantile normalization. Um, it, set, it sets up the, the group names as factors, uh, attaches the description to, uh, uh, attaches that to a slot called description. Then it designs the so-called model matrix where it builds a matrix um, of the measurements based on our group definitions for uh, calculating correlations, defines um, model names, and then it uses the, the linear model fit to, to fit um, uh, linear models to, to these group variances building a contrast matrix, um, using empirical Bayes to find the most significant ones, and then adjusting multiple tests um, by the false discovery rate parameter. So there's two, two basic ways to correct for multiple testings. One is a Bonferroni testing and uh, 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 a Bonferroni correction, and one is FDR. This one uses FDR, which is more appropriate for data sets of a large size. Really, this is all just um, code from from um, GU2R. The result of that is an object called TT. I believe we may be using this 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 afternoon. So so try not to to delete it from your workspace. All right, so so far that code. TT has um, returned to us the top 250 differentially expressed genes across the groups we have identified. And um, now we can explore the data. The top gene has the ID 8117594. I, be I believe these are spot IDs on the, on the microarray. So what are the expression, the original values? We can use this column name here and apply that to a function. So this is a bioconductor function. I, I told you that the data is in, hidden somewhere in this object. The function expresses expression values knows where to find the actual expression values and how to pull them out of the object. So this is a method which, is, which, which can now be um, associated with the data set. And this ID here, um, I, can, I can pull that out. I can look at the expression values or I can plot them as a bar plot. That kind of looks similar to the plots which we've seen on the on, on the uh, geo to our website. So our group 0, group 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. The expression values are relatively constant, and they go up, and then they slowly come down. And each triplet of three replicates is, is highly similar. So um, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is for the, the fifth highest value. Um, and so on. <clears throat> so if we want to return the, the data row for the top three differentially expressed genes, um, we, could, we could just use these row names or alternatively, is that even correct, 759? We could say TT dollar ID uh, one, two, three. Same thing. Now, I want to prepare this data for cluster analysis. Usually, uh, for cluster analysis, we have a similar consideration as for PCA. Scale might matter. Um, the absolute values might matter. We want to make sure that um, 
unless unless uh, our algorithm is robust to that, we have no NA, no non-available values, and and so on. So. And then it's useful to make a table that actually only contains the numbers, otherwise I always need to specify which columns I want to use. But if I, if I have a table that only contains the numbers, um, I... Um, no, this is, now we're going beyond the script. Now we're preparing the data for cluster analysis. So, um, to prepare that, I'll define um, a list of gene symbols which I can use to identify my data, um, then build a matrix, um, by iterating through all of the rows, and for each row, taking in turn the three values for the columns, one to three, and four to six, and seven to nine, and so on, and taking the average of them. So I'm taking the means of the biological replicates for all of the columns in my data set. And then I'm, I'm giving my, my data um, column names, and then I could just um, then I could just um, apply the IDs or the gene symbols uh, as row names. But if I apply the gene symbols as row names, I have to be sure that none of them are repeated. Row names have to be unique. So before I assign my gene symbols as row names, um, I need to check whether any of my gene symbols are, are unique. So I can apply the function duplicated gene symbol. So here, indeed, I find that 11 of my symbols are duplicated. Some of them are the empty string, so some of the, them do not have a gene symbol because they're spots that correspond to technical controls. And others are duplicated, presumably because the spots are not unique. So something like this, HSPA1B dash dash HSPA1A, probably means that the probe recognizes transcripts from both of these uh, presumably um, paralogs. So that may cause um, problems. So I massage my da data a little bit by throwing away everything that is duplicated or taking all the rows for which gene symbols are not duplicated and taking from the row names of my, my data set um, the not duplicated row names. And we'll also remove any that have spots for isoforms, um, <coughs> i.e., where we have, where we find the forward slash in the gene symbol um, using the grep function. So this is now our 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 expression data set. Um, we've taken averages of the individual measurements. We've made sure that all our rows are unique and uniquely represented by gene symbols and we threw away everything that cannot be uniquely mapped to a gene. So this is the kind of preparation that you usually need to do um, before you, you do any meaningful exploratory or clustering analysis. You don't need to execute that. If you want to make a local copy of the file, then uh, you, can, you can just write it and read it in this way, or make a binary object and write and read it um, in this way. So if you have large files like that that need to go through a script of uh, repeated um, um, controls of errors and, 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 and calculations, it's a good time every now and then to actually save a version so you don't have to recreate it every single time. 
Um, and then we can analyze this for clustering. So the, the very first thing I, I, I do is plotting a heat map. That's a heat map. What does that tell you? Or what, what do we see here? What are the rows? What are the columns? What are these thingies in the margins? The rows are the genes, right. So the, the, the fuzz, fuzziness here corresponds to genes, to gene, gene symbols of um, So 223, we started out with 250, but some of them were redundant, so, so we removed them. So we have 223 rows, 223 gene names here, which at that resolution I can't read. Um, the columns are? The Exactly, so the samples. So there's time zero here, time 12, time two, four, six, and eight. And what are these things here? These are called dendrograms from the Greek word for tree, dendron. So these are tree diagrams. And the tree diagrams tell us how this heat map has been sorted. So the, the heat map has been sorted uh, in a way <coughs> which places similar columns and similar rows next to each other. And the algorithm that determines that similarity and decides which similar things come next to each other, um, that works by building such dendrograms and, and then arranging that. It starts with the column first and then goes to the rows, or vice versa? It doesn't matter. Does it matter? No. Okay. So it, they're, they're independent. You can, you can do the columns first, and then you can do the rows, because uh, the columns and the rows are treated as being independent. So the order in which you consider them for the calculation does not matter. Any permutation of this dendrogram would be equally valid. Um, and that's actually an interesting question that I haven't actually been able to answer. Because if you, if you consider a dendrogram and say, consider this part here, Topologically, um, a dendrogram which I rotate around one of these branches is exactly the same dendrogram. It doesn't look the same, but it has exactly the same information. So any rotation around one of these branches here does not add information to the dendrogram. So you could imagine that I take this whole block the sole upper block here, and then just flip it, and that would correspond to fundamentally the same heat map. It's basically just a rotation around this branch here. So the question is, what does it mean that these two rows are adjacent here? That doesn't actually mean anything. So the adjacency only means something if the rows are connected in a very neighborly fashion. But if they're distant, um, from the dendrogram, then they are, um, the, the fact that they look similar um, is, is kind of deceiving. Now, what I suspect happens is, of course, the, d the layout algorithm has to make a choice of how we rotate these things when, 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 we, when we display them. And what I suspect happens is that it tries to rotate things in a way, again, where similar things are close to each other. Which, however, in this case can be deceiving because the two rows here and here, in fact, are not similar as evidenced by the dendrogram. They're actually quite far apart. But they kind of look similar here because, you know, that's, that's just the way this, this was chosen to be. What are we looking for in a heat map like this? One question on, uh, by what 
does it sort it? It's expression value, right? Or log expression. The, the dendrograms are built from the similarity of these vectors. So this is built from a, the similarity of the six-dimensional vector, which has individual expression profiles across uh, the, the conditions. In this way, it is sorted by the 223-dimensional vector, um, which has information about uh, one condition for all of the genes. Um, so what are we looking for here? First of all, we could ask, well, which of these conditions and which of these genes are similar? Just from looking at this, this would mean that all the genes up here vary in their expression values in a similar way across the cell cycle. If I look around, uh, if I compare the columns, this tells me which of the conditions are similar. So that tells me uh, condition T0 and T12 kind of turn out to be similar, which is, you know, the beginning and the end of the cell cycle, maybe makes sense. Conditions 2 and 4 are similar. Um, again, this is where the cell cycle starts increasing expression, and this is where expression decreases, so that's also similar. So that the grouping here would kind of vaguely correspond to our understanding of the biology in this here. So we can simplify this a bit, uh, basically, by doing the same heat map only for every fifth gene and randomly chosen. Um, since the values are randomly chosen in a different way, it, it kind of turns out in a similar way. So in this case, T0, 8, and 6 appear to be more similar than T12, T2, and T4. Okay, so this is, this is the first view of the data. In order to be clustering this, what we're looking for is block structure. Block structure means that if there's pronounced block structure, it means that somehow we have a way to arrange this that brings similar genes and similar expression values close to each other. That's what clustering is, is hopefully going to achieve. And that's what we will do um, in the next step after lunch. <laughs>